Chapter 3 The Paris Exhibition On their arrival in Paris, Jenny and Matt put their luggage into a buggy. They had taken the address of rooms to let out of the New York Herald. We could not find that one, and a gentleman who spoke Italian sent us to 29 Rue Cambon, and we got a room up four flights of stairs. We got a great big jug of hot water and both had a good wash. The lady of the house then came to tell us we must leave, and she and her husband were so excited that Matt could not make out what they were saying. It seems a lady and gentleman had engaged the room a week before, and they thought we were these people. When they saw our name on our luggage they found they were wrong. We were all unpacked and settled in nicely and they said they were sorry. We had to pack up and go downstairs again. They gave us the two daughters' beds that night and I thought we would have to find a new place in the morning, but they had another room ready two flights of stairs up and they brought in a gent who explained everything to Matt in Slavonian. The weather is very nice. After breakfast we went to the post office and I received a letter from Mrs. Calcott in Kent, but none from Australia. I was very much disappointed. Afterwards, we went to the station about our box but it had not arrived. A young lady called in as our guide. She is a Miss Lanson. Her father is French and her mother English. She has been brought up around Paris. She came back at three o'clock and we went shopping in Bon Marche and it was about seven in the evening when she left. We took a walk on the boulevards after tea. The exhibition tickets sell much dearer on some days than on others, and you always pay dear near the exhibition. When our guide is with us, she tells us just how much to pay and not anymore. Our drivers charged us too much before, and then wanted some more money for a drink, but there is none of that when our guide is with us. The 19th of June, 1900 The weather is very nice. We bought the exhibition tickets at sixpence, and a little further they were selling them at five pence. We went through the pavilions of Italy, Bosnia, Belgium, America, and Norway. The Norwegian one was very good with the animals and the various large fishes, furs, furniture, and the seals. The whale's head was good and there was one of a large beast called the Wolf of the Sea. We saw Denmark statuary, and potteries from Peru, France and Turkey. I bought several handkerchiefs there. The displays from Serbia, Hungary and Jerusalem were very good. There were a lot of costumes from different places. We then went right round the exhibition on the moving platform. It was awkward getting on and off. Our guide said she only knew of one accident when a lady had broken her leg. We had lunch, then went through Luxembourg, drawing rooms in Vienna, Finland, Bulgaria and Constantinople. The things made out of salt were got up beautifully, and people tasted it to see if it really was salt. The women from Sweden were in peculiar dress. They were making cloth and lace, but none of the lace comes anywhere near the Venetian lace. We went through old Paris and the old costumes and styles were good to see. There were those dressed in the costumes of the old guard of the 17th century, the reign of Charles VI and Isabella of Bavaria. The veils are of heavy material for men and women and trimmed with plush. The church and the little old shops of the old Paris look romantic. The Paris of then and now are quite different. We visited the Café de Hall where there were rough jolly good sort of women. They were jigging and dancing and dressed in the costumes of 1401 and 1600. Lastly, we visited the Russian Marine Department. The artillery was splendid, also some large boats, and we saw three holes blown in the side of an iron ship. We saw a man, woman and child who had traveled from Vienna to Paris in a wheelchair in 30 days. The husband and wife looked about my age. The woman and child looked worn out. I suppose they took it in turns to wheel one another. We bought a picture of a large man who is seven feet high and weighed 480 pounds. He is only 21 years old and was born in Marseille. When we went home, the drive through the streets was risky. You can hardly get through as the place is black with traps and people. I thought there would be a lot of accidents, but our guide said, no. The drivers are always growling, one at the other, and the police growling at them. The 20th of June, 1900 the weather was a little dull today, and the exhibition was even more crowded than it was yesterday. You would not credit that every day they finish some part and put on more exhibits. How hard they all keep working. We went through all the same pavilions over again and saw different exhibits. The Japanese section and industries are very good. 
Our guide told us we had done much more than the previous day, and they all say that we could not see everything there in a fortnight. We saw all kinds of clerical decorations that were all from France. The picture of a war god is wild looking. There were lovely lampshades and carpets that were made from goat skin and made by the peasants in Brittany. Their fishing costumes are quaint. In the center were the crown jewels of Viver and the Jubilee diamonds belonging to the government. These were in Napoleon III's drawing room of 1885. There were also a lovely picture of a French family, a half-pound weight book of prayers from the Duchess of Charter collection, Rothschild's beautiful tortoiseshell piles of porcelain, flowers and ivory, and the wonderful things they make out of the elephant's tooth. There is a picture of France made from different colored minerals. It was a present from Prussia to France. We saw three tables from America, two of marble and one of petrified wood. There was a Russian house made from pieces of different sorts of wood and all hand carved. Some parts have 1,000 pieces while others have 10,000. In Auvergne, a province of France, the people there wear quaint dress and are good at telling stories. Montmartre is a rough place in Paris. We finished the day by going through the shop of Bon Marche, which was very lovely and must have cost the owners a great deal. The 21st of June, 1900 The weather is rather unpleasant. We took the steamer and went along the Seine and in through the Trocadero entrance to the exhibition. We visited the African province of France and the industries there were very good. There were splendid specimens of beetroot, coconuts, wool, and birds in all sorts, small and large insects from Java and Timbuktu. Tonka was good, we could see the different gods they worship, one large with four heads and two arms. The West Australian section was very good with its wild flowers, timber, and gold. We went down the coal mine and through the different places there. It was very real looking and several men dummies looked just as they would look like at work. There were also slate, iron, lead, zinc, salt and gold. We saw a carriage of 1842 that carried Louis of the 14th century. Also a carriage of 1823 given by Marie Antoinette of St. Petersburg to her sister Marie Carbon of Paris. A baby pram that belonged to the Duke of Cambourg in 1701. A royal carriages with a horse back and front. A post chaise from 1789. The first train run on the public roads in France in 1830 and a candle machine. We went all through the machinery of the different countries. Those from Belgium, Great Britain and Norway were good, also the cavalierly system of the telephone system was good. The 22nd of June, 1900 It is the fourth day of the exhibition. The weather is beautiful. We took the omnibus and went in at the Ecole Militaire entrance. We visited all the marine parts of all the different countries. America was very showy, but there is not much really in it. The Swiss village was really good, the girls were nice looking, and such beautiful cows and mountains, and lovely falls of water. The women in the Swiss village were good to see while working the silk. I posted a card from there to Charlie. I admired the costume of the girl who sold us the card very much. We visited the boar farms and they do not seem to have much comfort. We went through the Norwegian fisheries and through several more pavilions. We then had tea. We waited to see the exhibition illuminated and then went up the Eiffel Tower. I bought a purse with the Eiffel Tower on it and had a splendid view of Paris from there. There must have been 20,000 people in the exhibition, as they only illuminate on Fridays and Sundays. When the water plays over the lights, we see all the colors of the rainbow. The 23rd of June, 1900 this morning was raining and as we had such a long day yesterday, we told the young lady guide not to come so early. By the time we visited the Madeleine Church, secured our opera tickets and did a little shopping, it was lunchtime. After lunch we took the bus to the Louvre Museum and the first picture we saw was a commemoration of a naval victory in 305 AD and many different pictures of Joan of Arc. We visited a church and a cemetery afterwards, and then another museum of very old memories. We saw a large stone ship that was supposed to have been found before A.D., various collections of the Rothschilds, a jewel case found near Vienna in 1884, another jewel case presented by St. Petersburg to France, the coat of arms of Henry III of the 16th century and some old Aryan cutlery. Afterwards, we visited a church on an island and there were the oldest memorials there that I have heard of. 
We later went to the theater and enjoyed it very much as the guide told us exactly all that was happening in the play. The dresses there were magnificent. We spilled some ink on the carpet at our hotel and had to pay one pound damage. The prices of everything in Paris are very high at present. On Tuesday we went to the Port des Champs-Élysées. on Wednesday to the Port Principal Place Concorde, on Thursday to the Trocadero, and on Friday to the École Militaire Exhibition. We saw a lot of the crown jewels of Charles X. In 1779 Clovis became a Christian and killed a man for breaking a vase from the altar. We enjoyed ourselves very well in France and all the cherry trees there were loaded. The 24th of June, 1900 When we left Paris the weather and the scenery was very much the same all through the country. Rouen seemed a very nice town and the Seine looked very large just there. Deep seemed a very old-fashioned place. We crossed the channel and it seemed very rough to me. In England we had to get our luggage through the customs and we seemed to wait a long time for our train to London Bridge. We were an hour and forty minutes late getting there and found that Mr. and Mrs. Calcott had gone home, as they were tired of waiting for us. However, we got to their home all right. The 25th of June, 1900 It has been raining ever since we arrived in England. Matt and Mr. Calcott went to get the luggage and it has all arrived safe. Marie Calcott and I went out for a walk and did some shopping. Everything here seems very cheap. The 26th of June, 1900 The weather's still very unsettled, but I think it will be nice tomorrow. I hope so, as we are going out. I helped my friend do a little shopping and Matt has picked out the cloth to get a Chesterfield coat made. The 27th of June, 1900 the weather was very dull and in the afternoon we went up to London Bridge Station and from there to Charing Cross. We booked our train tickets to Liverpool. We passed a church with three towers and found Mott's friends. They were keeping a large hotel and made us very comfortable there. The 28th of June, 1900 The weather beautiful and Mr. Dane and I and Matt went to the landing stage where we saw a lot of shipping. We came back and got our tickets to London Dairy. We passed through the park and saw the museum and several good statues, including Mary Queen of Scots on horseback. We sailed to Belfast at half past ten last night and arrived there at about half past nine in the morning. We then went on to Londonderry at half past one in the afternoon and met some people there who knew my uncle well. When we arrived at Newtown Cunningham we were taken to the door. It seems that when Arndy saw us she said to uncle that we were people who wanted some roses. And when he came out and as soon as I saw him I said, Are you Samuel Stevenson and have you a brother in Australia? He took us in and we met Auntie and three of my cousins. The other one called John is married and living in Londonderry, and we are going to see him tomorrow. He has two little girls and another one who died. The 30th of June, 1900 It rained in the morning. Arnie brought us tea and toast and bed. When we came down we saw the different flowers in orchards and all my cousin's numerous beehives and could see the bees working through the glass. We then had breakfast of ham and eggs, and Uncle insisted on us having another wee drop of toddy. After breakfast Uncle David, Sam, Matt and I went for a drive to Loch Luley in the Irish John Tinkar and we then went home to dinner. After having a long talk we visited the meeting house and the cemetery. And then we went for a drive to Moaner Cunningham where we could see the spire of the Leicester Canny Cathedral. We then saw the house where all the McGills were brought up, and all had a drink with a nice old lady there called Mrs. Haggarty. After we got home it came on a very sharp shower, and Auntie had a nice fire in the drawing room and a nice tea ready for us. We talked till supper time and Uncle was always wanting us to take another wee drop of toddy. July 1st, 1900 still raining. We had to be in Belfast at half past nine in the morning of the second, and as there were no trains running on Sunday, Matt and I and Auntie and Cousin Sam started for Londonderry in the Irish John Tinkart. We arrived at my cousin John's comfortable-looking place a little after twelve o'clock. They were expecting us and we had lunch there. John was very sorry he could not show us the Giant's Causeway and various views around Londonderry, but we had no time as our train was leaving at three o'clock. John and Samuel saw us off at the station. 
and he is very nice and said she felt as if she was parting from someone she had known all her life. John's two little girls were very nice and the eldest sang a hymn right through for us. On our arrival at Belfast in the evening at about 7 o'clock, we were disappointed to find that no boat was leaving until 8 o'clock on Monday evening and that we could have stayed in Londonderry for one more night. In Belfast we stayed at Crofts Commercial and Temperance Hotel in York Street. July the 2nd, 1900 The weather here is beautiful. Matt and I went for a walk and then took a tram and went from Shore Road to Balmoral where we had a good view from the top all around. I think Belfast a nice clean town and they tell me Londonderry is very much improved to what it was. We will sail from Belfast tonight and arrive in Liverpool about 6 o'clock in the morning. July the 3rd, 1900 We arrived at Liverpool at about 8 a.m. and went to Sinister and Mrs. Dane and found them all well. We had breakfast with them and caught the 12 o'clock to London. When we arrived at Euston Station we took a cab to London Bridge and had tea there. We then went on to Lady Well and found Mr. and Mrs. Calcott quite well and talked to them until the small hours. July 4, 1900 The weather is dull and inclined to rain, so in the afternoon Marie and I and Matt started off for Highbury to visit an old friend. We changed buses three times and then visited Highbury Park. We then went to the theatre to see the message from Mars, and it was very good. We had named a place at Charing Cross Station where we two have met Mr. Calcutt, but we watched one entrance and knew the other. All of our pleasure was spoiled and I think he was to be pitied more than us. July the 5th, 1900 The weather in England is dull, as is usual in England. We packed and sent our luggage on to Highbury Docks. Afterwards, we went out to do a little shopping, and Matt got the coat he had had made and was very well pleased with it. In the evening Mr. and Mrs. Calcutt and Matt and I all went to London and to Her Majesty's Theatre, and enjoyed seeing Rip Van Winkle very much. No one was disappointed with it. July the 6th, 1900 Marie and little Freddy came to the dock to see us off. Marie forgot Freddy's bottle and it came on a sharp shower and I had to give her my umbrella at the last minute so she could go and get it. The Ortona is a much superior boat than the Oroya, but I still like Oroya best. We passed Dover and Calais and saw two wreck steamers, and the point where a man once swam from Dover to France. We passed Hastings and Glenodds and then went to bed. July the 7th, 1900 The weather rather cold, but no one has been sick. The Orient Line boats are very steady. We have quite as many passengers coming home with us as we had going out. We are now at Plymouth and it seems a very large place. A good few of our passengers have gone ashore, but Matt and I did not go as we thought we had not been at sea long enough. We expect to be here for about five hours. A lot of new passengers came aboard here and after they and the males were all on board we started off again. One of the passengers told us they had visited a stone house at Devonport. We passed the lighthouse and saw the stump of the old original lighthouse where Grace Darling left her father to save the crew. July the 8th, 1900 The weather beautiful and all on board are fairly well. We have two ministers on board but it was one of our own passengers that gave out the hymn books and we all sang afterwards. We had a nice prayer and then another hymn, and then he gave a small sermon as well as he could, and we then sang a hymn. July the 9th, 1900 The weather's still beautiful and everybody well. We have just seen land, a little bit of the coast of Spain, and we expect to get into Gibraltar on Thursday morning. We passed the Orisiba, one of the P&O boats. The funnels were white and some were saying she must have experienced rough weather, as she was three days late. The 10th of July, 1900. We had lots of music, dancing and singing last night. So far we have had a splendid passage. Met hit me up at 5 o'clock to see the rocks. Gibraltar is very picturesque and the Spaniards were selling lots of fruit and tobacco. Met brought some very cheap wine and I bought a Gibraltar handkerchief. The gardens were very good. The 12th of July, 1900. The weather is beautiful and all is well. Every evening there is card playing, sewing and fancy work, music, dancing, and singing. The time passes quickly. We seem to have a good class of people on board. 
the 13th of July, 1900. Every day, we see two or three steamers, and we could soon see the rocks and land of France. We arrived at Marseille at about one o'clock and all got out there. There were eight of us in a party, and we were there for five hours. After getting off the tender, four of us, Matt and I and Mr. and Mrs. Barber, walked up to the town. We got a four-wheeler for five francs and then we all sat down in the cafe. Us two ladies had tea, whilst the gentlemen had wine. Afterwards we strolled all through the main streets and the buildings were all beautiful. Mrs. B bought a sunshade and Mr. B some provisions and a coat. Matt bought a suit and a light coat. In nearly every shop one of the hands were speaking English. It seems in a seaport they speak nearly all languages. The 14th of July, 1900 The weather beautiful and all hands seem well and happy. We began to see nice high mountains. We could see Corsica and Sardinia and the townships through the glasses, and they looked nice. The 15th of July, 1900 We arrived at Naples at about 6 in the morning. The Italians were selling things, and all manners of beggars came on board. A party of seven of us went ashore and we got a four-wheeler. As Matt could speak Italian, we didn't need a guide. We drove to the royal palace and as that was not open we went across to the royal church and visited that lovely cathedral. By that time the palace was open, and it was magnificent, and there was such a grand stairway. We then went to another museum and Mr. Barber became so ill we had to drive back to the boat with him and his son. It was a big holiday and we saw Naples at its best. The decorations in the main street were lovely, as were the lights and the illuminations in the evening. We next drove 12 miles to the buried city of Pompeii. We saw the charred remains of old clothes and bread and the bodies of horses, dogs and humans petrified, just as they were found. We saw the part that had only been dug out about a month ago. Then we went up a steep embankment and took in the panorama of the city. We walked on the top of a lot that has not been dug out yet. Women have been digging there for the last ten years, as they are more careful. I bought an English guidebook and many views of the place. The pictures on the walls in some instances are very good. Our guide took great trouble with us, and because Matt was able to speak Italian with him they became quite chummy. After having some refreshment, we started for our drive home. One of the wheels became troublesome, as it wanted oiling. We were going very slow and several of the people told the driver the wheel would soon break. We stopped at the first wheel right we came to, but they could not fix it, and when we came to another we all had to get out. It took a long time to cool down in oil and fix the wheel. We had to shout drinks for the men, and it must have been nine o'clock when we got back to the boat. Us three ladies went on board and left Mr. Well and Mr. Kazia to get some supper. One of the sailors heard us speaking and went and bought a basket of fruit for us. When he asked us to have some, we all said no so cross as we thought it was one of the Italians trying to sell us some, so he came round and explained, and was so nice. He said he could not understand a word as he was an Australian, so I said so am I, and he said he was born at Ararat, so I said I will shake hands with you as you are the first one from there I have met on the continent. His name was George Williamson. The Ortona did not sail till three o'clock. The 16th of July, 1900 we came to the Straits of Messina and the scenery on both sides of the ship was very nice. We sailed through for about two hours, Scilly on one side and Messina on the other. The 19th of July, 1900 The weather is very warm and we arrived at Porset at 6 o'clock in the morning. We are quarantined on account of the plague, so we are all buying stuff over the side of the boats from the Arabs. Everything is in a filthy state with the coal dust. We are leaving at about 12 o'clock and will be going through the Suez. It is very warm. The 20th of July, 1900 We arrived at Suez at about 6 o'clock. There are Arabs selling us fruit grapes and watermelons. We bought some sun hats, fans and shells and a pipe for Fred. I will now retire until we get to Colombia, unless something very interesting comes about. The 27th of July, 1900 the weather is pleasant today, but after leaving Port said we had it extremely hot for four days, and then we had the monsoons very bad for three days, and many were very sick. The 28th of July, 1900 The weather is pleasant. 
It is three o'clock and I have been playing whist all day. The Orton is averaging 350 miles a day. The 30th of July, 1900. The children have little sores all over them. This was caused through the excessive heat when going through the Red Sea. We took on about 10 new passengers at Columbia, including some Afghans. We arrived there at about 6 o'clock in the morning and after an early breakfast we were allowed to go ashore. There were six in our party and we took the tram as far as the Kalania River. We started to walk back and Mr. and Mrs. Barber and their child got tired so we took the tram back to town. We all had dinner at the Hotel de Europe. One of the officers on the Ortona told me you can buy a little boy or a girl for about five shillings. He was offered one for a shilling. A little girl followed us for a long time. She had such beautiful curly hair and lovely eyes, but their markets seemed very dirty to me. Afterwards, we went into a silk shop and all made some purchases. By the time we had afternoon tea it was four o'clock, and as the Ortona sailed again at five, we went back to the ship. August 1, 1900 We have had no amusement for a few days. Our entertainment committee seems to have fallen through. The 2nd of August, 1900 The weather nice and cool and all hands are well. There are about six colonials on board beside myself that I know of. There is a Mr. Robinson who knows nearly all the people I know. There are a great many immigrants on board who are going to Queensland. These are mostly Danes, Norwegians and Swedes. There are also about seven Irish girls. There are about 50 Austrians but they paid their passage. August the 4th, 1900 In the evening we had a splendid concert and everything went off very nicely. The performers were all stewards and they had to get permission off the captain to give us the concert. The stewards are not allowed to dance with the female passengers. August the 5th, 1900 I attended three church services. One was in the morning and the others in the afternoon and evening. They were very nice. August the 6th, 1900 the weather has been very squally and several times the seas washed over the decks. It was laughable to see the children and the ladies' chairs flying about. One of the Austrians and a friend were in the doctor's cabin and the doctor went flying and the two Austrians were drenched. We never had anything like that on the Oroya. August the 7th, 1900 The weather very rough and nothing much has happened. The only fun we had was through Mr. Wiseman, who said he was the world champion drafts player. He told everyone that they banquet at him in the first and second saloon, and when everyone tried to play with him, they found he could not play at all. One of the passengers made him a medal out of a big biscuit and put an address on one side and a draft board on the other and a few old bits of colored ribbon hanging from it and we nearly went into fit to see him walking about with it on. August the 8th, 1900 the weather a lot calmer now and everyone is in good spirits, as we will arrive at Albany tomorrow. Mr. Harry Wiseman had his photos taken this afternoon, and he said he is soon to box the champion of Sydney, a Mr. Charles Hall. Poor fellow, he lost his wife two years ago at Rockingham, and I am sure he cannot be right in his head. Matt has been playing cards with the Austrians all day. The last three of them get off at Albany to go to Norseman, and the rest go on to New Zealand. I guess in a day or two our trip will be over. This was the last entry in Jenny's diary. End of chapter 3